This is the city of Ypres in western Belgium. It's peaceful here now, but during the four years of the Great War, it was very different. By the summer of 1917, the names of Flanders and Ypres were known to the people of Britain and her empire as places of unrelenting misery and horror. Thousands of Allied soldiers perished here in a succession of costly battles that achieved very little. But there was more to come. Before the year ended, there would be yet another battle one whose name is remembered more than any other from that terrible time, Passchendaele. By the summer of 1917, Ypres had been devastated by three years of total war. During that time, the city had figured prominently in some of the Great War's most critical events. In the first few months of the war, during the late autumn of 1914, this medieval stronghold had been subjected to a sustained attack by the advancing Germans. It was destined to undergo systematic destruction the fight for control of the Ypres area would last for the duration of the war. By December 1914, the place had already acquired an evil reputation. Rising only slightly above this destruction on the slopes of a ridge stood a few villages whose capture seemed to elude the best efforts of the British. Their names were destined for immortality in the Great War's list of murderous places. Rouge, Gellerveld, and Zonnebeek. But the most significant, occupying the highest part of the ridge, was the village of Passchendaele. This place has exerted a fascination upon succeeding generations, not just for the desperate battle which ground to a halt here in November 1917, but also because of its unusual and poetic English pronunciation, Passchendaele. As the many memorials to the sacrifice here suggest, nothing could have been further from the reality of battle in 1917. Following the opening bloody encounters to the east of Ypres in 1914, the trench lines and no man's land had become firmly established. Britain declared war on August the 4th when the Germans invaded Belgium. Their strategy, known as the von Schlieffen Plan, was to push on rapidly in a wheeling right hook to seize Paris. They also intended to capture the channel ports for use as U-boat bases. The Germans had almost reached the coast by the time British troops were landed, the two sides finally clashing in Flanders at Ypres, where they remained locked in combat for the rest of the war. In the first month of war, the British regulars had already fought several major engagements in northern France. Before 1914, the British Army's main role had been to police the empire. The expeditionary force, which was sent to Belgium, numbered only 100,000 men, but they were highly trained and motivated. But now, like their generals, they were faced with something quite different. The massed force of the German army, capable of fielding four million troops. Ranged against the Germans was a combined force, the British, the tiny Belgian army, and four and a half million French. As the Germans probed westwards, the first skirmishes in the Ypres sector began on the 16th of October near the village of Westrosbeek, five miles northeast of Ypres. Here, British household cavalry units drew their first blood and sustained their first casualties. On the 19th of October 1914, the First Battle of Ypres began. The following day, the nearby village of Paul Capel fell to the Germans. On the 22nd, near the village of Langemark, there was a particularly bloody encounter. Across these open fields, massed ranks of youthful German volunteers, most of them students, marched singing towards the perplexed British troops who opened fire with devastating effect. Their slaughter is remembered here in the German war cemetery at Langemark. It bears testimony to the deadly accuracy of the British regulars who in one minute could loose off more than 23 rounds of aimed rifle fire. The German stranglehold was now closing around Ypres, the front line was established along a string of villages, Langemark, Zonnebeek, Gellerveld, Hollebeek, Vichart, and Messines. The shape of the front had a distinct bulge, 
It became known as the salient, a term used to describe any deviation from the otherwise straight trench lines. On the 31st of October, the Germans attacked across a wide front east of Ypres, breaking through the British lines at Gellerveld. There in the grounds of the chateau, they were held by the second Worcesters, who drove them back with a spirited bayonet charge and accurate rifle fire. Thanks to their prompt action, the German advance was temporarily halted. In the next few days, the Germans captured the villages of Hollerbeek, Wischart and Messines to complete their dominance of the higher ground. This despite a heroic stance by the London Scottish on Messines Ridge when they lost 321 out of 750 men. By the middle of November, the fighting was losing impetus. Deteriorating weather conditions and exhaustion among the troops meant they had to dig in, establishing trench lines that would remain for the rest of the war. Those last four hectic months of 1914 had witnessed the near annihilation of Britain's expeditionary force. The British regulars had earned the scorn of the Kaiser, who called them that contemptible little army. Thereafter, the survivors prided themselves in being known as the Old Contemptibles. In contrast to this, the German General von Molke praised them as a perfect thing apart, their sacrifice eventually enabling the British to secure Ypres and the routes to the Channel ports. In the meantime, the Territorials had to take the strain while Kitchener's new army was being trained. The end of the year also brought snow and the first Christmas in the trenches. For the opposing soldiers, it also brought a brief respite from war. On Christmas Day, a series of spontaneous truces broke out, bringing the two sides face to face. Here, near the village of Messines and at other places along the line, parties of Germans and British met in no man's land in what was a remarkable snub to the policy of offensive at all costs. British High Command ensured that any such spontaneous acts of friendship should not be allowed to happen again. With the new year came a terrible new weapon, changing the character of modern warfare forever. The first German chlorine gas attack was made here near the village of Langemark on the 22nd of April, 1915. The attack heralded the start of the Second Battle of Ypres, which raged throughout the rest of April till the 24th of May. Chlorine gas kills by flooding the lungs with choking fluid. Many thousands of men would die from its effects in the next few years. It blinded and disabled hundreds more who had little or no protection against the fumes. The impact was devastating. The only advice they'd been given was to urinate on their socks and cover their nose and mouth. This proved almost totally ineffective. On April the 22nd, the trenches in front of the deadly cloud were occupied by French colonial troops who broke and ran, leaving a five-mile gap in the Allied line. British and Canadian troops were rushed in to check the German advance. This memorial is a stark reminder of that first gas attack. It was a watershed in the history of warfare. Any pretense at chivalry had now gone. Within the space of six months, two epic defensive battles had been fought by Allied armies east of Ypres. Soldiers posted here approached the place with a sense of dread. Such was its reputation. The effects of battle were ever-present. Shelling and the constant rattle of machine guns meant it was never still. Over a period of a few months, this once proud city was reduced to a shattered ruin by the constant German bombardment. It was known that they could drop a shell with pinpoint accuracy when and where they pleased. Few men could withstand the strain of frontline conditions for very long, and it became vital to rotate units within each division and brigade in and out of the line as quickly as possible. To add to the general discomfort, mud was a major problem in the salient. When it rained, conditions underfoot became almost impossible. The delicate drainage system on the Flanders Plain had taken generations to construct, but the constant shelling destroyed it in just a few weeks. At Ypres, artillery was king of the battlefield, the gunners of both sides constantly probing for each other with counter-battery fire. The legacy of the gunners was everywhere. An endless stream of casualties was pumped back from the front causing cemeteries to grow with a predictable regularity. During 1916, there was little respite as the steady attrition which characterized death in the salient drained the army of thousands of its finest troops, 
In July that year, the Battle of the Somme began in France. There too, the killing was relentless. Haig had long been convinced that the war could only be won by defeating Germany on the Western Front. In April 1917, the French had failed disastrously south of Ypres and were now in desperate need of support. To add to the Allies' problems, the menace of U-boats were now a major threat as they spread even further into the Atlantic and the Mediterranean in search of targets. The total tonnage sunk was growing alarmingly with every passing month. To counter this and help the French, Haig planned a major offensive from the Ypres salient which would draw the Germans into a battle to protect their supply routes and their submarine bases at Ostend and Zeebrugge. There were also growing concerns about the French army's ability to carry on in the face of ever-mounting casualties. As on the Somme, the British army's willingness to support her Entente partner would be tested to the very limit of the soldiers' endurance. The villages of Messines and Vichart lie on top of a ridge at the southern end of the Ypres salient. During the first few weeks of the war, they had fallen to the rapidly advancing Germans and had remained in their hands. This area saw much bitter fighting in the first four months of the war as the towns and villages were pulverized. The whole landscape was obliterated by the ever-increasing volume of artillery fire. Among the many thousands of German troops defending the ridge was a young soldier who was destined to survive the carnage. Adolf Hitler had been recruited into the 16th Bavarian Reserve Infantry Regiment when war was declared in 1914. He'd arrived on the salient in October and saw action at Bezler and Gellervelt before being posted to the Messines Vichart sector. Kronart Wood lies just north of Vichart and was part of the line frequented by Hitler. The interior remains in a remarkable state of preservation. It was among these mine workings and blockhouses that he fought the British in November 1914. His bravery in action had earned him the Iron Cross and a reputation for luck. Soon after leaving one of these dugouts, he narrowly avoided death when it was struck by a British shell killing or wounding everyone inside. As the fighting became more centered on Messines and Vichart, Hitler was promoted to the rank of corporal and given the job of dispatch runner, taking messages back along the trenches from the front line to the regimental command headquarters at Messines Church. In the first year of the war, the church exterior was systematically destroyed, the crypt providing shelter as an emergency casualty clearing station. It's most probable that Hitler took shelter here as the guns reduced the village to a featureless wasteland of rubble. In 1916, Hitler was transferred to the Somme front where he was wounded in the thigh. In 1918, he was again awarded the Iron Cross First Class. His citation read, for personal cold-blooded bravery and a continuous readiness to sacrifice himself. It is a tragic irony that of the countless thousands who died in the salient, Hitler should survive his wounds. The course of the 20th century might have been very different had any one of them proved fatal. General Herbert Plumer was given charge of the British attack on Messines. Known as Daddy Plumer, he was a favorite with the men. This was due to his concern for saving lives and making sure that each assault was meticulously planned. Plumer's plans for the Messines attack had been started as far back as 1915. Along the Messines Vichart Ridge, he'd ordered the sinking of 24 deep mine shafts. They stretched for 13 miles under the German lines. The plan was to burrow underneath the German positions and hollow out a large chamber, which was then packed with up to 100 tons of high explosive. They would be detonated just before a major attack was planned to begin. In 1916, the priority was to maintain the secrecy of the mining operations while making sure that the explosives would be in place for the as yet to be determined date of attack. Haig knew that any attempt to break out towards the channel ports would first mean recapturing the high ground of the Messines-Passchendaele Ridge. But before Passchendaele could be taken, 
Messines had to fall. This was vital so that troops fighting their way up the Passchendaele Ridge could do so free from enemy observation and artillery fire. Underground, the miners were still relentlessly inching their way towards the German lines. To keep pace with this mammoth effort, civilian miners were hurriedly drafted into the army. They soon found themselves at the front. We never did any drill. They were in too big a hurry to get us there. They say there was miners from all parts of the country, and they were drafting them into Chatham Royal Engineers Depot. And this was really something new. There were Irish tunnellers from the London Underground. There were Scottish miners, Welsh miners, Northumberland, Durham, Yorkshire, every part of the mining field of this country. And they were all drafted in together. Within a week of enlisting, I was in the front line, right in the Ypres salient. Meanwhile, the French were in trouble. Following a series of crushing defeats, the army's morale was badly shaken. Acts of collective indiscipline, or more plainly mutiny, were causing havoc among the disillusioned troops. It soon became clear that any French cooperation in the attempt to break out from Ypres would be limited. Field Marshal Haig was convinced that the need for offensive action was vital if pressure was to be kept on the German army. The decision had finally been taken to launch the attack on the Messines Ridge in the early hours of June the 7th, 1917. Underground, the finishing touches were being applied to the lines of mines in front of the ridge. It was hazardous work. It was known the enemy miners were also at work, and occasionally work was suspended while attempts were made to locate them using geophones. They could occasionally be heard without such instruments. One morning, at dawn, the enemy put down a barrage over the area where he suspected the shaft to be, and hardly had the men at the top of the shaft got down to the dugout when a camouflet was fired, causing a minor earthquake. This was not a charge intended to blow to the surface, but to wreck the British gallery and hopefully trap their miners and leave the Germans in a position to resume their own operations. Of the 24 mines sunk, only 19 were to be fired. The workings of Petit Duvet farm had been discovered by the Germans and flooded. Another four at the extreme south of the line would not be fired as they were now outside the revised front of attack. On the 7th of June, the battle for the capture of Messines Ridge was finally engaged. It was preceded by the biggest artillery barrage of the war to date. Three and a half million shells were loosed off at the German trenches. Then at 3.10 a.m., 19 mines were blown. The time was exactly 10 minutes past three when I gazed ahead to witness the tremendous upheaval. A sheet of flame shot aloft to an immense height. A monstrous curtain of crimson drawn up suddenly along the whole crest and crowned with foaming black smoke. To our dazzled eyes, it seemed to hang thus for several seconds, while our trench rocked with a reaction. The arrows on this aerial photograph point out British troops skirting a mine crater as they pursue the stupefied Germans. They pushed ahead as quickly as possible to take advantage of the German panic. Many of the craters caused by the devastating explosions are still visible today evidence of the awesome power unleashed. Most are now filled with water or ringed by a protective curtain of trees. When the mines went up, they took an estimated 10,000 Germans with them. Most were simply vaporized as the huge fountains of earth rose more than 200 feet in the air. The mine at Spanbrook Molen was one of the biggest to be detonated. The tunnel began here at this farmhouse some 1,000 yards from the crater. It was, however, detonated some 15 seconds late, by which time the Ulsterman of the 36th Division had already gone over the top. Some were caught and crushed by falling debris. 100,000 troops advanced towards the remains of the Messines Ridge, supported by 72 of the latest Mark IV tanks. The circles on this aerial photograph show two tanks which became stranded amongst the morass of shell holes. General Plumer had perfected the tactic of the creeping barrage, the idea being that the attacking troops stayed as close as possible behind a moving curtain of high explosive. It proved effective, as the Australian 3rd Division attacked across the River Duvet, which was actually little more than a stream. They advanced up this gentle slope to be met with only token resistance. On their left, the New Zealanders had the task of taking Messines village. 
Ulan Trench was the German front line and first objective. The 1st Rifle Brigade took these blockhouses with little resistance before pushing on to the village. In the centre of the line, the Ulstermen of the 36th Division, following their tragic start at Spanbrookmolen, had advanced with little difficulty to reach the Messines Wishart Road. They fought their way into the village of Wishart, where they met up with their fellow Irishmen of the 16th Southern Irish Division. There were no sectarian tensions here, only the desire to clear the ruins of any remaining Germans. Further up the line, units of the 7th Loyal North Lancashires and the 9th Cheshires were committed here where the mines at Petit Bois and Hollandshire Farm had wrought havoc among the defenders. I can see them now, rising from the twisted network of branches and bursting forth from fresh green leaves, 20 or 30 faces grey with fear and great staring eyes from which the light of reason seemed to have been driven and they appeared before us with a forest of upthrown hands. Some cried out and gesticulated. Some threw themselves down and groveled at our feet. It was a terrible and unnerving sight. The biggest mine to be exploded on the day was here under the village of saint eloi at the extreme northern end of the line. Once again, the mine and the artillery had done their job. German resistance was negligible and the objectives quickly achieved. All along the line, the Allied forces had met with success and a minimum of casualties. Twelve hours after the start of the attack, the advancing troops had taken all of their main objectives, a virtually unheard of event given the usually turgid nature of fighting on the Western Front. It had been an outstanding success for General Plumer and his staff. The Battle of Messines was the first great set-piece victory for the Allies in the Great War. It had demonstrated the value of thorough preparation and planning. It was an object lesson within the checkered history of the war of how to fight and win a limited engagement while achieving defined objectives. Most of the Allied casualties in the Messines attack were sustained after the achievements of the first day as troops bunched up waiting for the orders to follow up. The fighting continued in a desultory fashion as the Germans withdrew to their prepared defences on the Walnutton Line, some way behind Messines village. Today, all is quiet here. The huge explosions which once ripped this landscape apart are long gone, except that is for the four mines that were left at the southern end of the line. Much to the consternation of local farmers, one of them went up without warning in 1956, when an electrical storm set off the explosive underneath. As for the other three, no one is quite sure exactly where they are. They remain a sinister presence and a reminder of the awesome power unleashed as part of the first British victory of the Great War. Following their spectacular success at the Battle of Messines in June 1917, the Allies now turned their attention to the main objective of the fighting in Flanders, the capture of the Passchendaele Ridge east of the city of Ypres. This place, with its romantic sounding name, was to become a byword for unrelenting death and destruction. What began as an optimistic and determined campaign in the heat of summer, ended three and a half months later, bogged down in a sea of mud. Of all Ypres' terrible conflicts, Passchendaele was the one which came to symbolize the true horror of Flanders, while the great defensive battles of 1914 and 1915 had given the place the distinction of heroism and seen the first use of gas, the 1917 battle took on a terrible momentum of its own. In the early years of the war, it was volunteer soldiers who came here to Ypres in their thousands. The toughened soldiers of the regular army, the Saturday night soldiers of the territorials, and during 1916, the Kitchener volunteers. Fortunately for the morale of the British Army, the men who had survived the Somme battles were a resilient lot. By 1917, the attitude of British soldiers on the Western Front had changed. Their experiences on the Somme in 1916 had led to the development of more effective infantry tactics. Commanders on the spot now knew the value of trained troops and the need to preserve them. More than 50 divisions were brought here to take part in the Third Battle of Ypres 
Many divisions of Kitchener's army, such as the 18th and 30th, had already established a reputation for competence and success on the Somme and at Arras earlier in 1917. Artillery had also improved, both in the number of guns and in the quality of the gunnery. Training and tactics had developed since the tremendous bombardment which had opened the Somme offensive the previous year. Effective use of artillery was now recognized as central to any hopes of success. Those skills and the ability to recover from Passchendaele's enormous appetite for casualties would be put to the supreme test on the flat land below the ridge. Following the brilliantly planned and executed Messines offensive, General Plumer and his staff were denied the opportunity to repeat it at Passchendaele. Field Marshal Haig, the British Commander-in-Chief, chose instead to appoint Sir Hubert Goff. He was to lead the attack north of Ypres. Haig had wrongly calculated that the younger man might have more thrust in the attack. His miscalculation would cost many lives. At this stage, Haig was convinced that the process of attrition, wearing down and exhausting the enemy, was still of vital importance. Historians still debate why he delayed the attack on Passchendaele after the success at Messines. Whether waiting for the French or taking more time to train his troops, the loss of time when the weather and ground conditions were ideal would prove costly. Whatever else he may have been as a general, Haig was never a lucky one. Flanders now experienced the worst August downpour for 75 years. The battle plan was to force the enemy to fight by threatening the channel ports of Ostend and Zeebrugge from where German U-boats were attacking Allied shipping. But first they had to take the higher ground of the Passchendaele Ridge. On the right flank, the attack was towards Gellerbelt along the axis of the Menin Road. On the left, the objective was the German defences on the Pilkem Ridge. The phrase higher ground could be misleading but in the context of Flanders, any prominence which rose to 60 metres or more was of great military value. In the meantime, preparations had to be made for the forthcoming attack. Men and artillery would have to be moved into place and supplies and ammunition stockpiled. Many of the troops were put through detailed and exhaustive rehearsals and provided with giant plans of the battlefield so they might study the plan of attack. During the next six weeks, an enormous logistical exercise was undertaken to gather the necessary men and material to this once quiet corner of Belgium. This delay following the capture of Messines Ridge gave the Germans time to recover and build stronger defenses. They constructed hundreds of concrete bunkers to guard the Passchendaele Ridge. They could only be overcome with a series of wearing down battles, confounding Haig's initial idea of a breakthrough. Goff and Haig had determined that the attack in the north from Pilkem Ridge towards Passchendaele would be the last high ground to be taken before the British broke through towards the coastal ports. While the battle raged on the ground, the air war now began in earnest. Although the Second World War is often considered as the time when conflict in the air became an essential part of total warfare, the fight for air supremacy in the weeks prior to the Battle of Passchendaele was vitally important to British hopes of a successful outcome. Because of the way in which the Germans had taken advantage of every fold in the ground, many of their defences were not visible to forward artillery observers. British guns were therefore often reliant on map coordinates and targets revealed by air observation and photographic reconnaissance. It was here that the fledgling flyers of all sides earned their wings. These men were enlisted into the ranks of the Royal Flying Corps from the Navy and the Army. They were a cavalier bunch with an often devil-may-care attitude, perhaps prompted by the fact that life could be all too short. Casualties grew as the number of flights increased and the quality of enemy fighter aircraft improved. The men flew without the benefit of parachutes, taking to the air in flimsy machines with little in the way of protection. If their aircraft was hit, it was most likely to catch fire. Many airmen carried a revolver or cyanide so that they could take their own life rather than be burnt alive or fall to their death. The Germans had been quick to realize the need to limit British air activity as clashes between them grew in number and intensity. The most notable of these was a dogfight over the Menin Road, involving 94 fighter planes at heights of up to 17,000 feet. 
A British balloon came down in flames, not far from the camp this afternoon. The observer got away all right in his parachute. About five minutes later, we saw a Hun balloon come down in flames opposite us. Only during the last week of July did it become clear that the German air defences were slowly weakening. If the gunners below could spare them a glance, it was only for the briefest of moments. These men were engaged in their own deadly game. During July, the British 5th Army assembled a massive strength of more than 2,100 pieces of artillery. Throughout this period, both sides probed for each other's positions in a desperate duel to gain the artillery supremacy. The heavy guns were capable of reducing the enemy positions to piles of featureless rubble. In an attempt to counter this, the Germans built a series of deep, heavily fortified bunkers. One of these impressive structures has survived, built into the quarry of a brick factory near the village of Zonnebeek. The Bremen Redoubt was built complete with electric light and accommodation for more than a hundred troops. Places like this proved to be major obstacles for the advancing British. Their great strength ensured that soldiers would survive any bombardment and emerge ready to fight. In two weeks of preparatory bombardment of German positions and the first three days of battle, the British gunners fired a staggering 4,283,550 shells. Such an incredible weight of firepower was the ultimate expression of the idea that the artillery could conquer while the infantry would follow up and occupy. The consequence of these massive bombardments was the complete devastation of the Flanders drainage system. Water gathered in countless interlinked shell holes, unable to drain away. The shell fire also destroyed the embankments that were needed to contain the many small streams which were essential to keep the water table below ground level. While this might have been a manageable problem in fine summer weather, the battle for Passchendaele was destined to be fought in the most appalling conditions. In reality, the battle for Passchendaele was a series of engagements. It started on the 31st of July with an attack on Pilkem Ridge. In the following three and a half months, places like Gellevelt, Polygon Wood, Zonnebeek, Brutzinder, Saint-Julien, Langemark and Polkapel would become notorious killing grounds. Goff had failed to recognize the importance of the German defenses here on the Pilkem Ridge and on the Gellevelt Plateau. As the British troops advanced, they encountered a series of heavily fortified German pillboxes seen on this aerial photograph. These strong points had been sighted to take best advantage of the terrain and caused many problems and casualties. Initially, the British made good progress towards and through the German outposts on the Pilkem Ridge, pushing northeast of Ypres towards Langemark and into Saint-Julien, where fighting for control of the ruins continued for three days. German counter-attacking troops halted and in some cases pushed the British back. As the casualties rose sharply, one of the most unfortunate among them was Captain Noel Chavas, a medical officer with the Liverpool Scottish. He was hit by a shell splinter on the opening day of the battle near Mousetrap Farm and died three days later. He was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross for his efforts in treating and bringing in wounded from the battlefield. Royal Army Medical Corps doctors and medical staff were often near the front, taking the same risks as the men. Chavas was the only man in the Great War to be awarded the Victoria Cross twice. He was buried in Brandhook Cemetery, where this unique headstone is a reminder of the cost of the battle. Due east of Ypres, along the Menin Road towards the Gellevelt Plateau, the German artillery now dominated the approaches. Here, carefully orchestrated shell fire fell in the areas of devastated woodland and valleys in which the advancing British troops were concentrated and relatively limited progress was made. Behind the British lines, places like Hellfire Corner achieved a grim notoriety. As the German gunners had the range of every inch of the men in road, Hessian screens were erected in an attempt to hide the endless stream of men and vehicles. But the Germans pulverized the road with shell fire until it resembled the surface of the moon. Nothing could move here. Casualties were relatively light compared with the opening days of the Somme. 
but it soon became clear that due to the German tactic of defense in depth, most of the casualties were suffered not during the initial assault, but while trying to secure new forward positions. The men in road and Hellfire Corner became known to the troops as lethal places, even on this deadly battlefield. This is the much improved view the British now had since the capture of the Messines Ridge. It was now much safer for soldiers to move around Ypres in daylight hours. The two sides were now at a stalemate in the hollow between the villages of Pilkem and Paul Capel. The British Army had achieved only a fraction of its first day's objectives, losing between 30 to 60 percent of its fighting strength. Half of the tanks had already been knocked out, many finding it impossible to move among the wilderness of shell holes and ditches. Then it began to rain. It was the worst rain to fall on Flanders for 75 years. Soon the downpour transformed the battlefield into a swamp. These aerial photographs show troops in forward trenches on the Gellerveld approaches. They reported that they were flooded knee-deep with water. Near the river Steenbeek, west of Langmark village, the position was even worse, with the men forced to stand waist-high in cold water and mud. On the 16th of August, near Langmark, the 29th Regular Division was sent in to attack. They faced a series of German blockhouses. The first King's Own Scottish borderers were given the job of taking them. Company Sergeant Major Jock Skinner and Quartermaster Sergeant William Grimbaldiston were both to win the Victoria Cross by capturing four of these strong points. This was an astounding achievement, given that the conditions had been described as the worst anywhere on the battlefield. Skinner was already renowned as a frontline soldier, having won the Distinguished Service Medal and the Military Medal. He captured three blockhouses and more than 70 prisoners single-handed. When he was killed in March 1918, he was carried to his grave by six other Victoria Cross winners, all from the 29th Division. As the attackers pushed relentlessly forward on the left flank, Langmark had been taken and the line had been pushed forward more than a mile along the saint julien paul capel road. On the right flank, they attempted to take the rest of the ridge from Gellerveld through to Broodcinder and ultimately Passchendaele. But the weather and German resistance stopped them in their tracks. As a result, Goff was replaced by General Plumer. He changed tactics, now conducting a series of bite and hold battles in an attempt to take the high ground. By the 15th of September, the British were able to launch the second phase of the battle with a series of closely staged attacks. Within five days, that phase broadened into the massive assaults known collectively as the Battle of the Men in Road. In reality, it was an enormous effort across a wide front east of Ypres. This phase of the attack was undertaken by both the 2nd and 5th Armies. Plumer had understood and perfected the tactics of taking strictly limited objectives. This strategy was put to good use in the Battle of the Men in Road Ridge on the 20th of September. The battle went according to plan, the British advance taking many of its objectives. As the Germans counter-attacked, they were met by defensive fire from carefully dug-in troops protected by accurate machine gun and artillery fire. Typical of the intensity of the fighting was that which took place here on this gentle rise known as Hill 60. It was originally formed by spoil dug out when the Ypres to Armentier railway line was built and was the scene of some of the bitterest fighting anywhere on the battlefield. It changed hands on a regular basis, both sides suffering enormous casualties in the process. Here the explosion of many mines and constant shelling made it one of the most dreaded places on the front. Hill 60 took its name from the fact that it rose a mere 60 metres above sea level but that was enough to guarantee its value as an observation post. Whoever held it had a clear view to Ypres. Nearby, the Australians had captured the western portion of the notorious Polygon Wood between the villages of Gellerveld on the Menin Road and Zonnebeek 
below Passchendaele. Six days later, on the 26th of September, the battle for Zonnebeek and Polygon Wood began. Again, objectives were achieved and counterattacks smashed. Haig could now take heart from the fact that his plan of attrition, that of destroying the German divisions faster than they could be replaced, was at last beginning to succeed. The fighting in the splintered remains of the wood was of the most fierce and brutal nature. The Germans were stunned by the ferocity of the Australians' attack. Many prisoners were taken, including this divisional commander and his entire staff. The Australians were to suffer some of their worst experiences of the war here, ranking along with those of Gallipoli and the Somme. This mound was a feature of the wood before the war, used as a rifle range by the Belgian army. In October 1917, it was transformed into a charnel house, covered with the bodies of British, German and Australian men. The Kaiser, seen here in the centre with General Ludendorff on the right, were thrown into confusion. Their defence in depth tactics had been outmanoeuvred by Plumer. Hundreds of Germans were taken prisoner in September and the beginning of October after their counterattacks failed. Many were relieved to be out of it. As the relentless rainfall continued, the British now had to face up to the effect of their constant shell fire on the drainage system. There was simply nowhere for the water to go. On the 4th of October, both sides planned attacks to the east of Ypres. As the rain began again, the artillery found it hard to place their guns on stable ground and register effective strikes. The misery of the troops sunk to new depths. This was the Battle of Pol Capel. Victory here was only partial due to the weather and the German defences. It is this period of the conflict that has become remembered for the mud. The continual downfall created a huge quagmire. It became the hallmark of this terrible battle. At this stage, the British were still 9,000 yards from Passchendaele village. Since the start of the battle six weeks earlier, they had advanced a mere 6,000 yards. Casualties were enormous but worse was yet to come. On the 12th of October, the first battle for Passchendaele was fought. This unenviable task was given to the Australians, New Zealanders and Canadians. Keeping a rifle in working order in the filth generated by a major artillery bombardment and subsequent infantry assault was almost impossible. Danger was ever present as the few tracks across the wasteland below Passchendaele Ridge offered easy targets for the German artillery. Away from those tracks, which the pioneers and engineers tried to maintain, the waterlogged shell holes interlocked, creating conditions in which men who slipped from the paths into the slime below often drowned. Two weeks later, the second battle for Passchendaele began, this time with the Canadians at the forefront. The troops edged forward, faced with the most inhuman conditions and stubborn German defence. Passchendaele was by now nothing more than a stain on the landscape. Every building had been literally blown off the summit as artillery mercilessly pulverised the positions. By the 30th of October, the Canadians were fighting in the outskirts of the village. A week later, it was all but over. As the sun rose on the morning of the 6th of November, unseen behind a curtain of British shellfire and leaden skies, the final assault upon the village of Passchendaele was launched. The Canadians found nothing there. There was nothing there wasn't even a German counter-attack. The campaign to capture Passchendaele resulted in almost a million casualties on all sides, similar to the Battle of the Somme the previous year. The Germans suffered almost 400,000 dead, wounded or missing. 35,000 British soldiers died and 30,000 went missing. Many among that terrible statistic had been swept away by shell fire or had sunk in the sea of mud. Most of the soldiers were in their early 20s, some of them much younger. The scale of the German casualties was so high that they never fully recovered. Their commander-in-chief, General Ludendorff, concluded that the losses at Passchendaele would eventually cost them the war. 
the many thousands of British and Empire troops who marched towards Ypres, more than a million of them would remain there, killed over four years of desperate fighting. The Menin Gate was built after the war in Ypres to commemorate the missing. Every night at eight o'clock, members of the local fire brigade sound the last post. Lest we forget the terrible sacrifice made here. On the 31st of October, the Germans attacked across a wide front east of Ypres, breaking through the British lines at Gellerveld. There in the grounds of the chateau, they were held by the second Worcesters, who drove them back with a spirited bayonet charge and accurate rifle fire. Thanks to their prompt action, the German advance was temporarily halted. In the next few days, the Germans captured the villages of Hollebeek, Wischart and Messines to complete their dominance of the higher ground. This despite a heroic stance by the London Scottish on Messines Ridge when they lost 321 out of 750 men. By the middle of November, the fighting was losing impetus. Deteriorating weather conditions and exhaustion among the troops meant they had to dig in, establishing trench lines that would remain for the rest of the war. Those last four hectic months of 1914 had witnessed the near annihilation of Britain's expeditionary force. The British regulars had earned the scorn of the Kaiser, who called them that contemptible little army. Thereafter, the survivors prided themselves in being known as the Old Contemptibles. In contrast to this, the German General von Molke praised them as a perfect thing apart, their sacrifice eventually enabling the British at war's most critical events. In the first few months of the war, during the late autumn of 1914, this medieval stronghold had been subjected to a sustained attack by the advancing Germans. It was destined to undergo systematic destruction as the fight for control of the Ypres area would last for the duration of the war. By December 1914, the place had already acquired an evil reputation. Rising only slightly above this destruction on the slopes of a ridge stood a few villages whose capture seemed to elude the best efforts of the British. Their names were destined for immortality in the Great War's list of murderous places, Hooge, Gellerveld, and Zonnebeek. But the most significant, occupying the highest part of the ridge, was the village of Passchendaele. This place has exerted a fascination upon succeeding generations, not just for the desperate battle which ground to a halt here in November 1917, but also because of its unusual and poetic English pronunciation, Passchendaele. As the many memorials to the sacrifice here suggest, nothing could have been further from the reality of battle. This is the city of Ypres in western Belgium. It's peaceful here now, but during the four years of the Great War, it was very different. By the summer of 1917, the names of Flanders and Ypres were known to the people of Britain and her empire as places of unrelenting misery and horror. Thousands of Allied soldiers perished here in a succession of costly battles that achieved very little. But there was more to come. Before the year ended, there would be yet another battle, one whose name is remembered more than any other from that terrible time. Passchendaele.
By the summer of 1917, Ypres had been devastated by three years of total war. During that time, the city had figured prominently in some of the great French. As the Germans probed westwards, the first skirmishes in the Ypres sector began on the 16th of October near the village of Westrosbeek, five miles northeast of Ypres. Here, British household cavalry units drew their first blood and sustained their first casualties. On the 19th of October 1914, the First Battle of Ypres began. The following day, the nearby village of Paul Capel fell to the Germans. On the 22nd, near the village of Langemark, there was a particularly bloody encounter. Across these open fields, massed ranks of youthful German volunteers, most of them students, marched singing towards the perplexed British troops who opened fire with devastating effect. Their slaughter is remembered here in the German war cemetery at Langemark. It bears testimony to the deadly accuracy of the British regulars who in one minute could loose off more than 23 rounds of aimed rifle fire. The German stranglehold was now closing around Ypres. The front line was established along a string of villages, Langemark, Zonnebeek, Gellevelt, Hollebeek, Vichart and Messines. The shape of the front had a distinct bulge. It became known as the salient, a term used to describe any deviation from the otherwise straight trench lines. Battle in 1917. Following the opening bloody encounters to the east of Ypres in 1914, the trench lines and no man's land had become firmly established. Britain declared war on August the 4th when the Germans invaded Belgium. Their strategy, known as the von Schlieffen Plan, was to push on rapidly in a wheeling right hook to seize Paris. They also intended to capture the channel ports for use as U-boat bases. The Germans had almost reached the coast by the time British troops were landed, the two sides finally clashing in Flanders at Ypres, where they remained locked in combat for the rest of the war. In the first month of war, the British regulars had already fought several major engagements in northern France. Before 1914, the British Army's main role had been to police the empire. The expeditionary force, which was sent to Belgium, numbered only 100,000 men, but they were highly trained and motivated. But now, like their generals, they were faced with something quite different. The massed force of the German army, capable of fielding four million troops. Ranged against the Germans was a combined force, the British, the tiny Belgian army, and four and a half million 